Amen. Amen. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, as Pastor Dean mentioned, this Sunday, today, we are concluding our sermon series entitled All the Fields. Somebody say All the Fields. And as I was praying and preparing for the close of this message series, uh, I couldn't help but ask myself a question. In prayer, to me, one of the ways God uh, talks to me is through questions. I ask him questions, and I feel like he prompts me in my spirit. And one of the questions that I asked myself was, God, what are you up to? And I asked myself that question because... I know that this sermon series was pivotal and strategic for a lot of people uh, in this church and for God's people. Um, we talked about sacred sorrow. We talked about it's okay with not being okay. We talked about longing to belong. We talked about the awe and surprise of God. We talked about fear. We talked about anger. And these are some very uh, impactful messages. And I believe that God is uh, an intentional God. Tell your neighbor, God is intentional. And I believe that the Lord moved on Pastor Dean to lead us in the direction of this sermon series. And as I asked God, what are you up to? Uh, I felt his response was, God really wanted to teach his people how to manage, navigate, and listen to our feelings and emotions. Because, somebody say because. Because when the Lord wants to take you and I, it's going to require people to be spiritually and emotionally mature. I'm going to say that again. Where the Lord wants to take us, it's going to require his people being spiritually and emotionally mature. Can I get an amen for that? So we're going we're gonna to conclude the sermon series um, from the book of Psalms, chapter 119. We're going to be reading from uh, verses 9 through 16. And an interesting fact about Psalms 119, it's the longest chapter in Psalms. And not only is it the longest chapter in Psalms, it's the longest chapter in the Bible. But this is not an ordinary chapter. It has an emphasis on certain things. And I believe I couldn't think of a better way to conclude this sermon series than using the longest chapter uh, in Psalms. I'm not going to read all the Psalms. We're just going to use a portion of it that kind of summarizes uh, this Psalm. So if you have your Bibles out. Uh, Psalms 119, 9 through 6. I'm going to go ahead and start reading. The question that the Psalms opens up with is, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. Somebody said, according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Somebody say, teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. If you are taking notes, I believe note takers are history makers, so make sure you take some notes. If you are taking notes today, the title of my sermon and the assignment that I am here to teach about is we are sustained by his word. Can I get an amen? amen? We are sustained by God's word. God said that his word won't return void. When he sends his word out, it will accomplish what it is supposed to do. In fact, God says, your thoughts are not like my thoughts. Your ways are not like my ways. And just as heaven is higher than earth, my thoughts and ways are higher than you. And just as the rain comes down in the snow and it waters the earth to bring forth fruit, so will my word do when I release it. And I believe the Lord wants us to be sustained by his word because he wants to produce something in your life from his word. And we see in the entire Psalms of 119, it reveals that we should appreciate, celebrate, and depend on the word of God to equip us to properly navigate through the twists and turns in life. Uh, is there anybody that ever had a twist and turn in life? A, a setback, a challenge, something that was unexpected. Well, God wants to know that even in the unexpected, he was in shock, and it's his word that's still going to sustain you. 
His word that will sustain you in the pain. His word will sustain you in the joy. His word will sustain you when you feel hate. His word will sustain you when you feel love. It is in him we move and breathe and have our being. Everything we need to sustain us and to offer stability is through the word of God. And God wants his people to be spiritually and emotionally mature by depending on his word. We don't got to worry about gas prices going up when we know that we are uh, givers and tithers because we know that we live in Goshen. We're in covenant with a covenant keeping God and God will supply me with all my needs according to his riches and glories. Yeah, but we still need to be practical as Pastor Dean mentioned, amen. I applied some practicality as well, my finances. We also see in Psalms 119, you see a repetition of words such as law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, word, ordinances, ordinances, all of these are a way to describe God's word. You see all of this throughout Psalms 119 because it is putting an emphasis on the word of God. Some scholars suggest that Daniel, David, and Ezra were uh, some of the writers of Psalms 119. And if you know about David, if you know about Daniel, and you know about Ezra, these are gentlemen that are not void of conflict, void of uh, tumultuous seasons. But yet, as they wrote, suggested these Psalms, we see that all throughout Psalms 119, there is a repetition, there is a rhythm, there is a hook, a course, and it's about loving the the word of God. You see in Psalms 119 that he is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We see in Psalms 119, it says that I have hid my word in, in my heart. And we see in Psalms 119, the entrance of his word gives us light. All throughout Psalms 119, there is an emphasis on the word of God. Tell your neighbor, there needs to be an emphasis in this season of your life to depend on the word of God. Oh, y'all didn't, y'all didn't say it like you meant it. Tell your neighbor... That there needs to be an, I know I'm used to saying long statements. <laughs> Maybe if I shorten it, it would have been easy to say it. Tell your neighbor there needs to be an emphasis on the word of God. <laughs> and we see in the entire book of Psalms, it teaches us that when we are in tumultuous seasons in life, we are sustained by God's word. We are sustained. I like what Psalms 119, 165 says. Great peace have they which love they, uh, thy law. And look at this part. And nothing shall offend them. Oh, Jesus. Which means when I love God's word, there's no matter hate. There's no amount of bitterness. There's no amount of condemnation. There's no amount of shame. There is nothing that can offend me. I'm unoffendable when the word of God is my love. I'm unoffendable when the word of God is my meat. I'm unoffendable when the word of God is my everything. And we're talking about feelings and emotions, and that's an insight right there. When you love God's word, your feelings won't get the best of you. They'll serve you. Some of us are serving our emotions and our feelings instead of using our emotions and our feelings to serve the kingdom of God. We know, as Pastor Dean eloquent, eloquently mentioned uh, uh, weeks ago, that feelings are not dictators, they're indicators, which means God doesn't want you to mute your emotions, he wants you to manage your emotions. So when you love the word of God, the, your emotions no longer dictate and control you, they now indicate things that God may want to speak to you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Our spiritual and our emotional maturity and stability is predicated on our relationship with the word of God. You cannot be emotionally mature or spiritually mature if you don't love the word of God. I'm going to say that again. You cannot be emotional mature or spiritual mature if you don't love the word of God. Because the opposition that is always against us, the challenges that may come against us, it is impossible to love certain people unless you got the supernatural love of God. And it's impossible to release something that you ain't encountered. You can't release love if you haven't encountered love. You can't release forgiveness if you haven't encountered forgiveness. You can't release peace if you haven't encountered peace. So we got to love the word so that in the word, God can reveal that he's Jehovah Shalom. He's the God of our peace. In the word, God will reveal that he is uh, uh, unconditionally loving towards you. It's through the word, God will reveal his natures, his, his attributes, his characteristics so that you can trust in him more than your external circumstances. 
We see in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. Now, in context, the writer is writing to people who need to be taught basic principles over again about the atonement of Christ and resting in Jesus. But I still think, although that's the context, there is a principle that we can pull from here to see that there is an importance of being mature. Uh, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers... In other words, you've been, come, you, 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 you've, been, uh, you've been taking the same test that you should have passed years ago. By this time, you should have been passing the test, but you keep failing the test. By this time, you should have had a testimony, but you're still in bondage to what God had ordained you to come out. By this time, you should be an overcomer, but you're still living like an undercomer. So for, those, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only in milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. We know that we are not right by our own doing. We are right by Christ. And righteousness means his way of doing things, his way of making me right. God's way of making me right is not of myself. It's through the blood of Jesus. That's why we partake in communion so we can be reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus that by his stripes we were healed. He was chastised for, for our peace, for, for our healing. And when we understand these things, we will now be able to handle milk excuse me meat <laughs> I'm not ready for milk anyways I'm lactose intolerant so I, I only eat meat and I'm just saying I prefer almond milk for my healthy uh, milk drinkers <laughs> I'm not lactose intolerant by the way <laughs> this just sounded good in the moment it says but solid food somebody say solid food Solid food belongs to those who are full of age, mature. Somebody say mature. You are praying promised land blessings, but you're still acting like a child, undeveloped, unwilling to work through the issues in the wilderness. So although we want next level results, you have to have next level appetites. You, you, you have to have a desire for meat beyond milk. You have to have a desire to, 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 to learn how to live according to God's word. God is telling us that if we are going to cross the uncrossable, if we're going to do the imaginable if we are going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that God can ever that we can ever ask think or imagine we can't step into this dimension where we see the supernatural power of God work still on milk we need meat we can't be spiritual vegetarians <laughs> I'm not against vegetarians I said spiritual vegetarians God wants to prepare some meat for you but solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is those, check this part out, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil or to discern both between good and evil. So God is saying that when you are mature, your emotions, your perception is mature to where you know what that is good for you and that which is bad for you. The emotions and feelings that you should follow and not follow. God equates maturity with us being able to perceive things accurately. Can I get an amen? So that's why we can't underestimate when it comes to uh, being a people that is transitioning from milk to meat, the power of a renewed mind. Somebody say the power of a renewed mind. It, it, scripture tells us right here. I don't have it on there. It was a bonus scripture that I added. The Bible talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice. You know, the issue with a living sacrifice is you can place yourself on the altar and then you can take yourself back off. You can break up with a relationship and then go back to that relationship. You can stop an addiction and go back to that addiction. 
You can, you can start tithing and then stop tithing. See, about being a living sacrifice is it's not just a decision you make once. It's a decision that you have to make daily because it's in being the living. As Pastor Dean mentioned, self-discovery doesn't come from doing you. Self-discovery comes from self-sacrificing. I'm not trying to help myself. I am sacrificing the version of me to step into the version that Christ died for me to become. It says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. See, when you offer yourself as a sacrifice, the other part of this verse kicks in now. It says right here, um, this is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. Sacrifice, something that costs you something. I always tell, the, I always tell people the kingdom of God is not complicated, it's just costly. He said you have to be childlike to receive the kingdom. In other words, he didn't make it complicated. It's just going to cost you something. And that cost sometimes is our selfishness. That cost sometimes is our pride. That cost sometimes is our ego. That cost is us giving up our pain and forgiving and releasing people to God and versus us trying to be God and hold them hostage to something that they've done to us in the past. This is your sacrifice. And, then, and then, then after it says, this is your true and proper worship, then it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Can we give God some praise on that one? I just need 10 people to praise the Lord. That everything I need is inside of me, but in order to pull out what is inside of me, I have to renew my mind to activate what the Lord has already deposited in me. You have peace living inside of you. You have joy living inside of you. You have love living inside of you. The Bible says that the incorruptible seed of the word of God lives inside of you. So if you want to pull out that which is incorruptible, you have to renew, renew your mind to activate that which lives inside of you. I get people coming up to me often uh, when I speak in different places and, and, and they come up and they like, man, can you, and I'm for prayer. Can you pray that God do this and God do that? And, 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 and you know, my mindset is I'm gonna pray for you, but sometimes it's not a prayer issue, it's a renewing of the mind issue. Sometime what you're coming up for the altar to de get deliverance in, it's not prayers from us that's gonna deliver you, it's you renewing your mind that will deliver you. But it's easier to outsource something you need to do to do for some. Let me say it better this way. It's easier to outsource to someone else to do something that God has ordained for you to do for yourself. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, living a life of isolation and independence because we know the Bible says that a man or a woman who isolates themselves seek their own desire. But sometimes because we don't want to be spiritually, because we don't want to be emotionally mature, we will relinquish or delegate something to another person that God has delegated for us to do for ourselves. And that is renew our mind, renew that stinking thinking. Come out of that Egypt mindset and step into that promised land mindset. Come out of that poverty mindset and step into that prosperous mindset. Come out of that bitterness, that hate, that resentment and renew your mind to love, forgiveness and joy. But it requires work. It's not something that you can get in a one-time uh, encounter with God. This is a daily sacrifice. I don't know if somebody told you that you can grow by just coming to church once and it, it will be all good. No, you don't just come to church on Sunday. You got to take what you learned on Sunday and apply it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because it is a daily walk. Somebody tell your neighbor it is a daily walk. Scripture says as a man. Our woman think of in his heart, so he is. I have a graph up here. The reason why renewing our mind is important because if you don't like what you're feeling, you have to change what you're thinking. Our thoughts and our feelings are connected. So when I feel fear, it's because I'm thinking an abundance of fearful thoughts. 
When I feel bitterness, when I feel hate, it's because I'm rehearsing past trauma. So if you want to change what you're feeling, you have to change what you're thinking. And the only thing that has the power to divide between soul and spirit, marrow and bone, is the word of God. Because the word of God will cut in you what you need and cut out of you what you don't need. Oh, y'all missed a moment to shout. (laughs) Pastor Dean with me on this one. The word of God has the ability to penetrate your mind, your thoughts, your heart, your trauma, and inject righteousness in you and take out what is not right in you. So I have a graph. Thoughts influence our imaginations. Our imaginations influence our desires. Our desires influence our emotions. And when it becomes a full-blown emotion, now our willpower is influenced. This is how somebody can have a dream about somebody and feel like they were supposed to marry them. Because you were thinking about them, (laughs) and in your imagination, you marry them. (laughs) And now you have a desire to be with them, and now it feels so real, it feels so true. It is now a full-blown emotion, and now it is influencing your will. Oh, Jesus. I think that hurt somebody. <laughs> but if you change your thoughts, your imagination will begin to change. If you think on things that are pure, if you think of things that are lovely, if you think of things that are just, you now are allowing God the opportunity to speak to you because he speaks in the invisible realm sometimes. The, word, the, the, the Bible says the world that was created was framed, the world that we see was created by words that we can't see. In other words, all of creation was created by the spoken word of God. And oftentimes we are trying to fight our thoughts with thoughts. But in order to take those thoughts captive, in order to shift the way you think, you can't fight your thoughts with your thoughts. You have to fight your thoughts with the word of God. Because the word of God will sift the wrong thoughts out and unlock the right thoughts that he has for you. And then he will start showing you that you're called to be a pastor, as he did me. He'll start showing you you're called to do certain things. You'll start seeing yourself beyond where you're at right now, and therefore you'll start desiring it. And now you want to pursue it. And now God has the opportunity because your will is influenced because he spoke to your thoughts which forms some imagination, which now is a desire, and now you're using your emotions to serve the kingdom. Versus serve your kingdom. I'm teaching (laughs) y'all. So Nehemiah verse 9, chapter 9. Somebody say his word sustains us. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 19 through 21. Uh, In this this context, uh, in the book of Nehemiah, the people are coming together to read the word. And this is, they're they're praying to God and they're making new vows to God. But they, 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 they put... Uh, uh, God in remembrance as they were reading this scripture and I like what this says because it, it talks about the children of Israel because the children of Israel were emotional people can I get an amen they complained they murmured they were happy they were sad they were up they were down and it says right here but in your great mercy you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness somebody say wilderness Let me just pause. Now, when we think about wilderness on a map, it's more like a desert if you think about it. But I believe that we use the term wilderness to describe something that's undeveloped. In other words, God will use an undeveloped season to develop you in that season. God will use ambiguity. God will use uncertainty. God will will use I don't know what's next to get you to trust him and knowing that he knows what's next so that you're relying on him and not on what you can see or what you can make happen on your own. So it says the pillar of cloud still led them forward by day and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven are water for their thirst for for 40 years this is this is what I love you sustain them for 40 years you sustain them and they lack nothing their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell now what we have to understand manna was food from heaven but manna was only supposed to be a transitional food 
It wasn't supposed to be something that we live off forever because manna was a parallel. It was a, a, it was a poetic way to teach us that man doesn't live off bread alone, but off of every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. Can I get an amen? So if we understand that manna was used to transition the children of Israel, that means he brought them out of something because he wanted to bring them into something. Which brings me to a thought of deliverance and freedom. I believe, as I mentioned, that God had moved on Pastor Dean to uh, lead us in the direction of this message because God wants his people to be free and not just delivered. Stay with me, stay with me. Because deliverance is me coming out of Egypt, but freedom is me stepping into the promised land. And some of us been some of us been delivered, meaning we've been called out of something, but we haven't stepped into something. That's why you keep going back to that something, because you can't be free from addiction by just stepping out of it. You step out of addiction, but you step into a greater vision. You step into community. So when you step out of something, which is deliverance, you have to step into something, which is freedom. But if you never step into something that which you were delivered in, you'll keep going back to it or it will look attractive because you don't have anything else before you to step into who am I preaching to somebody say your word will sustain me God sustained them so that they will begin to learn his ways that they can begin to trust him so that they can sustain themselves with him in the promised land he guided them like kids right they were on milk per se but in the promised land, it was going to require them to not just lean on God in the way he delivered them. They had to now learn how to fight for themselves. Now, um, one of the ways God helps transition us is he has to transition what we have an appetite for. Although God gave the children of Israel manna, they still had an appetite for worldly food. And I, I thought about um, when me and my wife, one of the things that we love to do is eat. We're, we're, we will... We are what you would call foodies. We love going to the restaurants, right? And for the longest time, I thought restaurants, when they kept bringing bread out, it was because they were trying to get me full. But then I was like, that doesn't make sense because if they're trying to get me full, that means I'm not going to pay for no food. I'm going to just get full off of bread and the bread is free. And then I realized when you go to like a five-star restaurant, they offer what you call a full course meal, which is anywhere from four to five or three to five meals. And what they do is they give you bread in between the meal so that you can cleanse your palate. So that which the new meal that is in front of you, uh, uh, you'll be able to taste it. But if you didn't have the bread to cleanse your palate, you'll still be tasting the old food. So, so can I propose to you that when God was giving manna to the children of Israel, he was trying to cleanse their palate out of bondage. He was trying to cleanse their palate out of wanting worldly things. So manna was a transitional food to sustain them so they can now start having an appetite and thirsting and hungering for righteousness. Oh, Jesus. Oh, man, y'all missed it on that one. So the manna is, is a metaphor of God was cleansing our palate so that way we stop desiring the things of the old and now start desiring what he has for us in the new. Can I get an amen? amen? But what you have to understand about transition is also as God is sustaining you in transition, Satan is trying to tempt you in transition. In seasons of transition, Satan will always try to offer you things that will feed you but won't fulfill you. In transition, you got to be careful from them old boyfriends or girlfriends that are trying to hit you back up. In transitions, you have to be careful for those temptations and those feelings that are trying to bait you back to certain sins for comfort. Because in transition, Satan is offering you pleasure, but at the expense of your purpose. He doesn't mind giving you pleasure as long as it robs you of purpose. He didn't mind giving Samson Delilah as long as Samson stopped killing the Philistines. He doesn't mind the children of Israel wandering as long as they don't start living in the promised land. And, and, and what I propose to you is in transition, God wants to sustain you, but also in, trans, in transition, the enemy wants to tempt you. 
He wants us to be immature in the way of our thinking. He wants us to, to complain and murmur like the children of Israel. And many of us know this facts. What was a 40-year journey was only supposed to be an 11-day journey. So they wandered in a situation. They wandered in a season that was supposed to be short-term, but it ended up being long-term. Have you ever found yourself in a long-term situation that was really supposed to be short-term? Have you ever found yourself, uh, I'll try this once and then I'm not going to do it again, and you look back, you've been doing it for five years? Have you ever said that I'm just going to have fun and go on a date with this relationship, but it ain't nothing, I'm, and then you end up being with him? <laughs> we have to be careful not making long-term decisions in short-term situations. That's just a word for somebody. So my question to you is what you're eating right now, metaphorically speaking, is it numbing you or strengthening you? I'm going to let that sit there. What you are eating, is it numbing the pain or strengthening you to face the pain? What you're eating in this season, again, this is all the Feel Sermon series because God wants us to face our fears. He wants us to know that sorrow is sacred. He wants us to know that it's okay to not be okay. He wants us to long to belong. These are all the sermon series titles. He wants us to be in awe. But we have to understand in this transition season, what we are eating, is it numbing us or strengthening us? Because you cannot, let me say it this way. I'm going to ask a question. Can you embrace, hear me out. Can you embrace, I want to say this correctly, can you embrace eating something you don't like for a season so you can break the cycle of defeat and dysfunction that has kept you in bondage all your life? You may not like being around people, but can you partake of that for a season? You may not like for forgiving, but can you partake of that for a season? You may not like take, uh, turning the other cheek, but can you partake of that for a season? You may not like being sober, but can you try eating that for a season so the cycles that have been keeping you in bondage can break over your life? Yeah, yeah. Exodus 13, verse 17 through 18. It says, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, this is very important, lest perhaps the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. So God let the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. In other words, God had a path to the promised land, but Although he, although he uh, ordained for them to step up in this promised land, he still didn't remove the ability or the, the path for them to fight to get to the promised land. Which means Christ has made us free from sin, from the temptation, from generation curse, but he has not made us free to not still fight to step into that freedom. We still have to fight to step into that freedom. What is freedom? Freedom is simply, I'm going to make it kind of simple, fulfilling the plan of God on your life, walking in your destiny. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will because in the center of God's will, there's provision, there's resources, there's everything you need in him. So when we want to step into freedom, freedom is about finding where God wants me to be, loving how God wants me to love, choosing to love difficult people, doing all those different type of things. But we prolong freedom when we avoid battles, hardship, and pain. I'm going to say that again, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get my Pastor Dean on. Let me get a little butter behind me. <laughs> We prolong freedom when we avoid battles, hardship, and pain. As Exodus 13 mentions that God had a shorter route to get them to the promised land, but lest they see war, lest they realize they had to fight, they will go back to Egypt. Now, I do want to validate that some of us, it probably was good that God didn't take us the short route because we might not have been ready to face the things that we are now ready to face. See, now that we got a sermon series called All the Fields, that what he wanted to take us through, we weren't ready for that. But now that we are equipped to handle our spirituality, equipped to handle how we feel it, and not to mute our emotions, but to manage it, I believe what been delayed in your life, God now sees that you are developed enough for him to 
bring that path in your life. I believe some of the wandering, the years of wandering that you and I might have been living in, I believe that it's coming to an end in Jesus' name. You don't have to wander no more. You don't have to keep going the long route because you are now ready to face what is ahead of you. Yeah, he used the long route to develop you, but you have what you need. You have what you need. You have what you need. You have the Holy Spirit. You have community. You have vision. You have friends. You have the principles of God. And most importantly, you have the word of God. He will sustain you. He will keep you if you want to be kept. He will provide for you. He will protect you. He will see that your feet won't swell, that your clothes won't a break. He will sustain you through his word if you will trust him. We shouldn't be driven by the discomforts of pain, but rather driven by the benefit and the hidden treasures of pain. The avoidance of pain will always be used as a bait back to bondage. When we avoid pain, it is always used to bait you back to bondage. Because sometimes the pain is so unbearable in this undeveloped wilderness season. The pain can be so unbearable in this amb ambiguity and this uncertainty. So I'd rather go back to being a slave in Egypt than face the pain in this wilderness. But I'm here to tell you, you are equipped to face the pain. You are equipped to face and fight through the wilderness because the, the, God doesn't want you to go back to Egypt. He put you in a transition so that he can develop you so that you can now step into the promised land. It's easy to settle in the wilderness season because it's better than the previous season. It's a deceptive season. Don't settle. I feel like the Lord is telling me to tell somebody, don't settle in the wilderness. Don't settle in the uncertainty. Don't settle uh, in the ambiguity. Don't, don't say yes to things that you're not sure God wanted you to say yes to. Don't give virtue. Don't give all of you to, to, to someone that don't even love the Lord the way you love the Lord. Don't settle in this undeveloped season. Rather, sit and allow the Lord to develop you in this season. Oh, that's a word for somebody. Don't settle. Sit. Sit means that I'm going to get up again, right? I'm sitting so I can be developed so that I can step into the promised land. Can I get an amen? I'm closing. Psalms 103 and 7 says, He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. I believe Moses knew the ways of God. The children of Israel just knew what was in the hand of God. In other words, they had a relationship through Moses. This is not the season that you can just rely on your pastor's relationship. This is not the season where you can just rely on your mama's relationship. This is not the season in life where you rely on somebody else's prayers. You have to know God as Moses knew God. You can't be like the children of Israel and outsource your relationship to someone when God wanted to speak to the children of Israel but they were afraid. They had a wrong perception of who God is. You don't need to be afraid of God. He loves you. He cares for you. He had a plan for you. And I'm encouraging you, don't outsource your relationship with God to somebody else. Begin to develop that relationship in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen on that? The children of Israel were too emotionally fragile to go into the promised land because in order for them to possess what God wanted them to possess, they had to first dispossess the current occupants. God gave them a promised land, but there were giants in that land. There was battles in that land. But even though there were giants in battles, he had already ordained them victory over those giants in battles. But the giants in the battles were not to cause the children of Israel to lose. It was to show them how big their God is. The battles you're facing, the giants that you're facing, it's not there to defeat you. It's there to reveal to you how big your God is. Okay, let me say it on this side. Th 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 those battles and giants that you're facing, it's not there to defeat you. It's there to show you how big your God is. You serve a big God who likes doing big things. And the Bible says in Numbers 14, as I'm closing, it talked about how 
all of the children of Israel lifted up their voices and cried and people wept that night all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation and said to them if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in his wilderness this wilderness why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims would it not be better for us to return to Egypt so that they said to another let us select the leader and return to Egypt what happens when you're better off with something but it still hurts to not have it what happens when you're better off with something but it still hurts to not have it what happens when you're better off with that relationship but it still hurts to not have it what happens when you're better off with that habit that addiction but it still hurts to not have it we got to face that pain and we have to have a right perception about God and let me leave you with this thought God uses the process of the wilderness to break the cycles off of our life so we don't go back to Egypt the process of the wilderness is not to defeat you but to develop you God uses process to break cycles God uses process to break generation curses. God uses process to break addiction. God uses process to break any sin that so be, uh, easily besets you, that stops you from running the race in which the Lord has called you to run. So the process that you're in is not to, to defeat you, it's to make you bigger, it's to make you greater, it's to make you better. It's so that the Lord can break every emotional immaturity every uh, 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 immature spiritual thought is so that the Lord can develop you can I get an amen so I'm here to declare and if we have prayer teams let's, let's come on up I'm here to declare your emancipation against the wilderness you are now free from living in the wilderness because you know that the word will sustain you he had you live in the wilderness only so you can get to the point to where you trust in his word Whatever that wilderness is for you, I feel like the Lord is declaring that season is done. That season is over with. You don't got to go back to that. You don't got to run back to Egypt. You don't have to stay in the wilderness because you are sustained in his word. You know how to be emotionally and spiritually mature. So now you are ready to fight the enemies ahead of you so you can step into the promised land and be all of what God has called you to be. I just need 10 people to get prayed right now go ahead and open up your mouth and praise the Lord hallelujah come on keep praising break free from that addiction break free from that bitterness break free from that hate this is your emancipation you are not staying in the wilderness no more you won't go back to Egypt no more you won't live bondage no more. You won't live in low places. You won't compromise your virtue. You won't compromise your soul. You won't give up your mind. You won't give up your body. You won't give up your vision because you know that the word will sustain you in Jesus name. The word will sustain you. The word will keep you. He will deliver you. He will, he will protect you. He will provide for you if you would just trust in him. Oh, I feel like we got a shout in the house, Real Life Church. Go ahead and give him a shout of victory. Go ahead and give him a shout of praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Give him a shout of victory. Praise his name. Praise his name. Father, we thank you for that word. By raise a hand, if anybody in here is in a transition season in their life, a wilderness-like season, and you're ready, to declare your freedom against it, I just want you to lift your hands up. I see all those hands and I wanna pray with you and for you. And we're gonna close out the service. And if you have more work that you need to do with God, we wanna encourage you to come up. Go ahead and lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that which is overwhelming them, you will overwhelm that. That which is troubling them, you will trouble that. Lord, we declare our freedom, not just from Egypt, but also from the wilderness. We know that we're not supposed to pitch a camp in, uh, pitch a tent in the wilderness, Lord, but that was a transitional season so we can step into freedom. I pray right now, every attack, every assignment, every plan of the enemy that tried to keep them, 
manipulate them, lie to them, frustrate them, delay them into stepping in the promised land. I declare right now in the name of Jesus that that enemy and his power is broken right now off of that off of that woman, off of that man, off of that mind, off of you in Jesus' name. And I pray for anybody in here who does not know Jesus. Real briefly, if you want, an, you want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, and you want your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, this team, we want to pray with you and for you. If you do not know the Lord, but you want to give your life to Christ today, I'm going to bless the service, but afterwards, I want you to come on up, and I want you to receive prayer. Can we give God some praise one more time, y'all? Father, we thank you that we're blessed coming in. We thank you that we're blessed coming out. We declare that we are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, the lender and not the bar, and everything we touch shall prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. See you at Church in the Park next week. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that message ministered to your heart and lifted your spirit today. Hey, to find out more about joining the RLC online family, you can find us on the Church Center app. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. God bless you.